Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. It's a full house on a rainy day in Minnesota. Isn't that great? So welcome. And um, welcome, everyone, to the launch of Professor Steve Miley's book on constitutionalization. Do you want to hold it up, Steve, so sure. you can see the beautiful cover uh, of human rights law, implications for refugees, which is hosted by the Law School's Human Rights Center. I know many of you, but for those I don't know, I'm Fanula Nielon. Uh, I'm a faculty director of the Human Rights Center. And so we're really delighted. The Human Rights Center is really delighted to, um, to have this book launched, to welcome this book. Launching a newly published book, I think, is a really important recognition of faculty endeavor. It's a recognition of the importance of supporting scholarly work. Um, and it's a significant acknowledgement of just how much work, how much research, how hard writing is. Um, and, uh, and also a recognition of uh, publication in the most elite scholarly forum. This is a book published by Oxford University Press. And those of you who will know how hard it is to write a book in general, but in specific to have Oxford publish your book will recognize how important it is that Steve's book has been published where it is. And it's also just a recognition that um, writing books are labors of love. We don't generally get the kind of royalties that are commensurate to the amount of time that's spent writing up the book. So um, uh, it's a really good celebrating then is really important. Um, let me introduce briefly Steve. Uh, Professor Steve Miley is one of our most active affiliated faculty at the Human Rights Center. But his most important day job, of course, is that he's professor uh, at the School uh, of Law here at the University of Minnesota, and he's director of the Law Clinics. Um, we're particularly pleased also that the center was able to support Steve's book by offering the support of research assistance over some years, and also from a grant from the Human Rights Lab and the Minnesota Model Fund. And I see Joachim Salzberg's here, one of the co-directors of the lab and the model. So thanks to all of those from the broader university who come to join us to celebrate. Um, many of you will know this book is a really important contribution to the debates around the world around the domestication of human rights. In many ways, human rights only work when they are domesticated, when states bring them home. And Steve's book is a really important insight into how that process is working, particularly how courts have taken that role on. Um, and it's a beautifully comparative, I had the great pleasure to read this book, so I know it and know that it's just a beautifully comparative piece of work. It's grounded in really finely nuanced case studies. Um, and I think one of the things that illuminates this book is Steve's long tradition of writing and cause lawyering also kind of is the heartbeat of some of the book about how lawyers make a difference by pursuing really thoughtful strategies about how they use courts to protect human rights. So I think it's a really great thing to be celebrating. We're also, of course, joined, I'm going to leave the stage, we're joined here by Professor Chris Roberts, also professor here at the law school, uh, Edith Wardlow, research scholar and the Vance Openman research scholar at the law school. And um, Chris is also one of our faculty affiliates at the Human Rights Center and brings an enormous wealth of interdisciplinary uh, knowledge to his work in human rights, his background and PhD in sociology of law particularly illuminates the work that he does. So I want to close by thanking a couple of people to Amanda Lyons, our executive director, and to Abby Nelson, who helped get everything together to get you all here. And I'm going to hand over this conversation, which will be led by Steve with the one mic that we're all sharing, <laughs> by Steve and by Chris to talk about their book. What a great thing to do. Steve, what can you say? Thank you so much, Ben. When, when Abby mentioned that the venue would be changed uh, to this room, uh, I said a silent hooray because it's such a wonderful room. This is very gathered. It's, uh, it means so much to me that all of you have come. There, there are folks from uh, many aspects of my life, friends from Madison, where we lived for 17 years before we came to the Twin Cities. Um, certainly here in the Twin Cities, academic colleagues, intrepid students from the Immigration and Human Rights Clinic, who every day represent asylum seekers and refugees who are seeking protection here in the US. Um, and the Human Rights Center has been a great source of support, both uh, financially through the grants I've received that's been mentioned, but also just in terms of the, uh, the work that I've been doing. Uh, so we also have folks here from the law library that have been indispensable 
in in my work. We have just a fantastic library staff um, supporting the research that the scholars here at the U of M conduct. And of course, this book would not have been written without my wife, Lee Peng, who <laughs> endured uh, several years of my anxiety and, and, and uh, this coming sort of fruition. So it means so much uh, to me. And thank you to Chris for agreeing to do this. Um, I suspect a lot of people are here actually to hear the kinds of questions that Chris asks rather than my answers because he's so good at asking questions. Um, I, I'm not going to do a reading from the book, but in terms of recognition, I did want to read one portion of the acknowledgments. Um, I know that last week there were some events here at the law school in honor of uh, David Weisberg um, and his contribution to human rights here at the University of Minnesota and throughout the world. And so I'm just going to read about, about that because David, of course, is not here. Um, this book rests on two foundational concepts that have fascinated and motivated me for many years, the human rights of non-citizens and cause lawyering. As to the former, I am indebted to my late University of Minnesota colleague, David Weisbrook, who encouraged me to think creatively about the ways that human rights treaties might better serve refugees and asylum seekers. His commitment to human rights for all, and particularly for non-citizens, infuses this book and indeed all of my work. So this book, as, as well as the book of many others at this law school and elsewhere, um, is part of David's legacy. So. I think we should honor that today. So, thank you. Uh, Chris Dolier. <laughs> I'm going to put this uh, the microphone there. If you need more volume, let me know, and I will hold it up. Uh, but uh, we'll, we'll see if that works uh, for for now. Uh, this is wonderful for me to be able to speak with Steve and to speak with you about Steve's work. Um, we were going to meet about 15 minutes beforehand to talk about what we were going to talk about, but we didn't end up talking about what we were going to talk about. So Steve has no idea what I'm going to do. <laughs> and he said, maybe at best, Chris, uh, if, if, if I didn't know exactly what you were going to do. And I said, yes, Steve, that is true. <laughs> I'll begin with a little story. I've been talking with my students, I've been talking with colleagues a lot about what the future holds for lawyers and for academics in the age of chat GPT. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I, I uh, maybe two or three weeks ago, asked it to give a synopsis of my book. Uh, it's been out for a while, but uh, just to see how decent it was. And it did a fairly fantastic job. Uh, not as good as what I could have done in synopsis, but it did it in 15 seconds. And I was talking to a person who works uh, for uh, AI at, at a, a major company, I won't say the name, but uh, a major company, we use their products every day, everyone here uses their products every day, who does ethics and AI. And I said, it's on the one hand kind of scary in terms of professional security, what this technology is doing. But when I read an output or when I ask it to produce an image, uh, I was also at the time playing around, playing around with AI music. You can create music now. And I said, it's missing something. You know, I, I read the output, I listen to music, I see, and it's beautiful, but there's something there that doesn't quite fit. And uh, th this person whose life is dedicated to doing AI, machine learning, all the algorithms, he, said, he smiled and he said, Chris, it doesn't have a soul. <laughs> it doesn't have a heart. That weird thing that you're experiencing is the absence of a soul, it's the absence of a heart. And from that day forth, I've been thinking a lot about what having a soul and what having a heart means for our work. And when I read Steve's book, there is something in here that no computer can do. There is a soul, there is a heart, there is a deep feeling and a commitment that goes beyond the words on the page that I can feel. And today, instead of just doing a sort of what's in the book, I want to summon that spirit for us today and have Steve 
talk about that. And to have, I think it'll be a treat for all of us to be able to turn this book launch event into something that can only happen here in this room. And uh, uh, Steve, if you're if you're game, but 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 just, just for the sake of explanation, let's begin just with a standard summary of the book. And then we can get into that higher level, uh, the, the spirit, the soul, and all that good stuff. So, so Steve, do you, you okay. want to just uh, sure. uh, I'll offer a, a few minute yes. uh, overview of what the book is about? We'll start with the body, then we'll get into the soul. <laughs> I just have a few notes. Only um, uh, sure. So what the book is about, uh, in, in, in a few words, is the idea of how lawyers in five particular countries that I selected. And we talked about how I did that because as I tell my students in, in class, if you're going to do a study, a case study, you need to explain why you picked the countries that you picked, but we can talk about that later. Um, Colombia, Mexico, uh, South Africa, Uganda, and the United States. How lawyers in those countries have utilized constitutionalized human, human rights law provisions, that is human rights law um, uh, provisions in that have been embedded into the national constitution, how they utilize them on behalf of refugees. But it's international refugee law, the international treaty, and really the, the one, the uh, Refugee Convention of 1951, which established the definition of a refugee. That's been of somewhat limited um, uh, success in protecting the rights of refugees, particularly as we move into the more modern era, era where we have uh, many, many refugees um, who are migrating because of armed conflict and, and climate change. Um, and often in large groups where under the refugee convention, you have to show that you're eligible for asylum uh, because of individual persecution that you may have suffered in the past or that you're likely to suffer in the future. So what's happened and really has, has nothing to do with refugees is that more and more countries over the last two or three decades have been putting these human rights provisions in constitutions, often without any interest, probably in enforcing them, and certainly not in using them to protect refugees. They do it for real good. They want to be part of the international community. In some cases, they want to get funding from um, uh, foundations or organizations, typically from the global north. So it's, it's it's a bit of a charade, but the law is on the books now. And because it's in the constitution, as opposed to some you know um, treaty. Uh, uh, that is hard to uh, enforce and judges are, are reluctant to, to interact with them. It's part of the constitution, which is the highest law on the land. So enterprising lawyers, and we certainly have some, many of them in the United States are trying to use those provisions um, on behalf of, of refugees. What are the, what, how does that happen? How, how do laws get constitutionalized? Really in, in, in a couple of different ways. Either countries will incorporate entire treaties into their constitutions. So, so a country will say um, uh, Mexico, for example, is um, uh, the, the, all of the agreements, all of the international agreements that Mexico has agreed to um, are part of this constitution. So the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which has very broad protection for children, is part of the Mexican constitution. We, of course, have nothing like that in, in the United States. Rights to health care, rights to education, other social and economic rights that are you know, out, out in the uh, atmosphere of, of human rights treaties are now part of, of the national constitution in many places. So what I wanted to see is how lawyers utilize those provisions and have they had more success in advocating for their clients um, in using those constitutional provisions. The, uh, sorry, the, the other way that, that um, uh, human rights get incorporated in the constitution is countries will just use a particular provision, like, for example, the right to dignity, which has been very useful in uh, South Africa. As South Africa has a, its constitution has the right to human dignity. <laughs> Lawyers have used that to argue for rights like um, the right to work or the right to education for uh, for refugees and asylum seekers. So it's creative use of, of, of those kinds of truths. So I, um, that's basically what the book is about, is looking at the kinds of strategies that lawyers use, what has worked, what hasn't worked so well, and then how those lessons might be applied uh, to, to other countries.
Can you say a word about the asylum seekers, who, who they are, what are they fleeing from, what are they going towards? <laughs> But what's their story? No, sure. Well, it, it of course varies from, from country to country. Um, I picked those five countries because they are major refugee receiving nations. Um, uh, some recently so, one of because Colombia used to be a country of emigration. Most folks were leaving uh, Colombia because of the armed conflict there that lasted for decades. But because of uh, what's been going on in Venezuela over the last decade or so, um, Colombia has, is now becoming uh, a major refugee receiving nation. Other countries, the United States certainly, uh, South Africa uh, have been refugee receiving nations uh, for a longer period of time. What drives refugees? Uh, I should ask the students in the clinic. They know this uh, uh, is stuff for them, right? Um, uh, all kinds of things. Uh, certainly, um, uh, political tumult. Um, People are afraid of uh, um, persecution or fear of persecution or have been persecuted because of their political opinions, uh, because of their gender, because of uh, their sexual orientation, um, because of groups that they might belong to. Those are sort of the classic, in, some of the classic individual reasons why people uh, flee their homeland and seek refuge elsewhere. And as I mentioned earlier, what we're seeing now is more um, through group-based uh, refugee flows based on climate change uh, and based on armed conflict. And of course, those two uh, refugee-generating phenomena are just going to increase as, as time goes on. Certainly, climate change isn't going away anytime soon, and armed conflict is just increasing around the world. And the current structure for dealing with refugees is inadequate to handle that. It can handle some of them in another country that's doing it, 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 it can somewhat handle those individual cases, you know, those cases based on individual persecution. But dealing with it on a group, base, uh, group basis is, is a real challenge. And this is where some of these constitutional provisions may come into play. All right. Are you ready to get into the solar? Yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> that's the bones. That's the bones. Let's go to the soul. This reminds me of uh, one of my best friend's weddings when I, I got up to speak. Uh -oh. And he got so nervous. What, what is Chris going to do? Oh, yeah. No, this, this, this will be good. Um, <laughs> you might be my best friend, Chris, but I wouldn't have you as my best man. Yeah. Yeah. That very reason. I'm very good at Steve, don't worry. So when I read your book, Steve, I am really, I, I think of this as a present problem, a contemporary issue that really needs people like you and the people you study to ad uh, address it. But it's really a timeless problem. I mean, the problem of refugee, people with seeking asylum, people seeking safe passage, safe harbor. And throughout reading your book, I kept on coming back to a poem that I read when I was in 10th grade in Latin over the course of a year. And it was about an exile. And it really, to me, captures the sort of heart and the essence and the feeling. And I, I want to invoke that muse for us today and really get into some of the deeper things that brought you here to this research and the people you talk to. So I'm gonna read first, not out of Steve's book, uh, but out of uh, Virgil's The Aeneid. And for those of you who know this uh, epic poem, uh, Aeneas was a refugee, he was an exile, he was fleeing. And uh, as we have in poetic convention, Virgil had to invoke the muse in order to get the spirit. And he begins with the famous lines, Arma virumque cano, Troia qui primus aboris, which means I sing of arms and the man fated to be an exile who long since left his home and came to our shores. A great pounding he took by land and sea. Great too were his sufferings and war. Why was he driven to such endless hardship and such suffering? Why so much anger in the hearts of the heavenly gods? 
And behind the work that you're doing, Steve, are stories, epic stories, of people who don't have a voice. They don't have a community. They don't have a people to protect them. They don't have a place to call home. And that's all they're looking for is a place to call home. And if we begin not with theory, we begin not with empirics or facts, but we begin with inspiration. Steve invoking his muse on the page, before the pages have number, he writes to me. <laughs> this inspiration and in the acknowledgments, which you went over, uh, you invoked your muse here, uh, University of Minnesota Law School, the Human Rights Center, Fanula, the people who have been part of this community for you. Uh, I won't read all the names, but a lot of us are sitting here. Can you talk about that community a little bit more than uh, uh, you did it for, but, but it, it obviously is important. It gives you inspiration. What, what, what does that mean to you? I can't talk about it now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm complaint that uh, you said on uh, Saturday Night Live. Um, wow. That's, um, I thought you were going somewhere else. In the <laughs> I'll start with the way I thought you were going to go, and then we get it. So, in, in terms of giving people voice, uh, I mean, that is in part what inspired me to. To write this book because a lot of it does stem from my interest in what lawyers do and that actually inspires the work that i do clinic here where i've co supervised with mckenzie the, the immigration and human rights clinic and our goal uh is fundamentally to give voice to folks who don't have it and uh we do that through representing folks who are forced to be their homeland for some of the reasons I talked about earlier. Um, and I think that my interest and my passion for that that kind of work on a practical level has, has made me very interested in, first of all, why lawyers do it in a variety of countries and a variety of social and, and political contexts. Um, and then how they do, what tools they use. We have certain tools here in the United States. Uh, they're somewhat limited compared to the panoply of human rights protections that are available in in other countries. So I've always been fascinated about that and, and uh, interested in, in how lawyers in various places cope with the fact that their clients really have no hope. I mean, it's, it's hard to think of a more marginalized groups than, group than, than refugees, folks that have certainly no voting power, very, very little political power, and they are at the mercy of the countries that where they're seeking Refuge. So that's that's that that is the impetus in terms of the uh, what what made me interested in this topic. I would say in particular, the support of the community here has been um, uh, it's tough to describe. I mean, it's it's tough to put into words. The the, the faculty here, the library here, students here, support staff uh, who have helped particularly. With the kind of empirical work I do where we get interviews and those things have to be transcribed and sorted and it takes time and and and, and certainly the research assistant that I have here. Uh, we have very high quality students who attend this law school. So but also the support of non-lawyers, uh friends who have some sense of the work that I do and have been very supportive of that. So that's been really critical also keeping my feet sort of on the ground uh, so I don't get too caught up in theoretical uh, principles, but, but focus on, on what really matters. So um, that's that's where a lot of it comes from. That's that's the, um, the support that I've had from this institution. I mean, the fact that we have a human rights center here at the law school that's dedicated to this Kind of work that was inspired by David Weisberg that Finn has uh, uh, continued. It's it's an invaluable resource and has been for the work that I did. Talk to us a little bit about the lawyers you spoke to, and uh, one of the things that I say to my students who are aspiring lawyers, who will be lawyers, uh, who will be academics, is that. There is a wealth of knowledge that doesn't exist in books, 
that's transmitted and transferred from person to person at the water cooler, uh, sitting shoulder to shoulder working on something. Uh, there are strategies, there are techniques, there are rules of thumb that never make it into print that <clears throat> is part of our craft, is part of our trade. It's part of what we must know and must deploy in our work. And oftentimes that doesn't get captured in the actual black letter print of what we write. And one of the things, Steve, that I think is just so amazing is that's actually what you do. You have gone all around the world yourself and then uh, through Zoom brought people to you uh, to ask them about the work that they do and the various strategies that they use for these impossible situations that people find themselves in. And uh, I, I think that that, in and of itself is an incredible gift that your book has within it, in addition to all your empirical analyses and uh, uh, the work that you do identifying uh, uh, the processes and modes of constitutionalization and so forth. Uh, but can you talk a little bit about uh, your interaction with the lawyers and what sort of things you gleaned and learned that now you can share with others? Sure. Um, it's always fun to interview lawyers, and they usually don't have any trouble talking about what they do. And they're <laughs> happy to do that. And they just know. Uh, and in many ways, I was aided by COVID uh, in, this, in that um, the grants that I received from the Human Rights Center through the university uh, were to have covered travel to each of the countries so I could do the interviews in person. Uh, and then COVID hit. And we were in, I was in lockdown in the UK actually for, for much of that time. But it turned out to be a wonderful opportunity because everybody was at home and they didn't have a whole lot else to do. And I was, I guess, some diversion from, you know, uh, watching TV all day or whatever, you know, uh, whatever they were doing. So I could do two, three, four interviews in a day when usually when you're in the field, of course, you're lucky if you can get one done in a day and people cancel and that sort of thing. So that, that helped. I think also, frankly, the fact that they could talk about the substance of their work sort of outside, you know, filing a, a, an application for asylum or writing a brief or feeling like they're knocking their heads against the wall, which many of them do, uh, and that they could sort of pull back and think about some of the broader questions. Some of them were uh, eager to do that, which, which of course helped in, in the writing of the book. And I've always found that when I interview cause lawyers, um, in part because, speaking of heart, much, many cause lawyers are, are drawn to this work because of the heart, because there's a cause that they believe in that they can pursue through representing individuals. So that cause lawyers uh, have both individual clients, but larger causes as, uh, that, they're, that they're advocating for. So. Um, I think they were they were they were quite candid. I was quite surprised, and and, and you know because I I, I uh, promised um, confidentiality, which of course I kept in the book. And half of them said, "I don't care. You can you can put my name in." You know, and there were some of them quite critical uh, of the government. Certainly, um, uh, the one exception to that interesting was uh, in Uganda, where. Um, it can be both a personal and a professional risk to criticize the government. In fact, the, the one main refugee rights organization in Uganda was shut down a few years ago for about six months because it filed a lawsuit against the government based on its policy of, um, uh, with regard to um, LGBTQ uh, asylum advocates. So they have to be a bit more careful, but they've adopted strategies accordingly. So they don't follow litigation, they do a much more cooperative uh, training government officials. Um, <laughs> but um, anyway, the, yeah, it was it was really interesting to talk about to talk to them about their work. Uh, and there were certainly there, there were common themes. Some things are different and, and all of the, the political, social, historical context uh, guiding their work differs from country to country, but uh, there were certain commonalities too. One of which, one of the most striking, was controlling the narrative, and this, in some ways, gets gets to uh, uh, part of your question, earlier question, Chris, because um, uh, you know more and more lawyers are doing this work in really all countries of the world are facing increasing xenophobia within their societies, and a narrative from the government that typically 
places refugees and, and, and migration generally in a national security context. And what I have found through the through this um, book, but also just through my own advocacy in the clinic and elsewhere, that once the government is able to do that convincingly, it's really hard to counteract that. And uh, so what these lawyers do or try to do is to control that narrative, both by particularly with cases that are going to have far-reaching effects, try to find sympathetic claimants, um, uh, but also to tell stories individually. You talked about stories before. So a lot of their work, they feel, is storytelling, not just to the judge on a particular case. We'll do that. Mm -hmm. We do that in, in our advocacy and clinic, um, but also in their work with the media and, and, and outside, uh, because, they, because they know that that can, that can uh, influence maybe not directly influence judges, but just kind of influence the culture. And, but it, it's, it's a tough battle and, and they all recognize that. Um, the other thing that I found among all the lawyers is both well, a sense, I, I can't really even say hope, I wish I could have. Uh, there's a lot of despair in part because of that increasing xenophobia, but also despair because in countries, even with, let's say, a progressive constitutional court like in South Africa that has issued some ruling in favor of refugees, like the right to work, the right to health care, et cetera, they feel like most of their work is spent defending those rights, not advancing the rights. It's, it's reactive. It's conservative in a way, mm -hmm. trying to protect the rights that already exist. A lot of them went into this work wanting to you know, increase the rights of, of refugees, and they feel like they're always on and that's true in the States, uh, too, of course, which makes the work frustrating at times. Uh, what drew you to this work? Oh, good Lord. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're really getting into this. And, 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 and uh, in particular, you, you said some of them feel uh, often that they're beating their head against the wall. I mean, yeah. the, the, this tireless work it often goes unthanked. There are pitfalls and obstacles at every turn. And you can't go into this work thinking you're going to, at the end of the day, every day, have a victory. Um, but at the same time, there's something that must pull you or push you or drive you to continue on. Yeah. Wow. Well, I guess it's a two-part answer. Um, what drew me to it? Oh, gosh, how many years ago? 40, at least, in law school. Uh, working with the um, uh, Lawyer Community for Human Rights in New York, which was doing work on behalf of Guatemalan lawyers who were uh, being murdered by the government during the, the, the Civil War in Guatemala as it was in other Central American countries at the time. And one of the groups that was being persecuted was lawyers. And I was in law school and of course, you know, uh, preparing to become a U.S. lawyer, you don't really have to worry about physical safety for the most part. Uh, but I was thinking, well, certainly in Guatemala, you would have to think about that before you went into that profession. And um, so I did some work on that, got very interested in asylum uh, in, in general. And then when I had a fellowship at Georgetown Law School, we represented asylum people mostly from El Salvador because of the uh, war there. And I just got um, hooked by it. You know, um, the stories are, are, are very compelling you feel like you're having an impact. Um, it takes a psychological toll. I don't think I realized it at the time. I've realized it more in the last couple of years when we've had, we've had a couple of setbacks in, in our cases, including one where we get actually achieved asylum for one of our clients from Honduras. Uh, and then the, the case was appealed during the Trump administration when the Trump administration was appealing just about all grants of asylum. And uh, the case was reversed, and that was devastating. You know, and this work can be a bit devastating for the lawyers who do it, for the students uh, who practice it. So um, it's important to have you know the support of, of, of that's where a lot of that support comes actually, or why that that's so important is because you can start blaming yourself because you feel like you're the one playing that sand between those folks and being deported to their home country where they're going to be tortured, they're going to be raped, uh, or otherwise, uh, otherwise persecuted. So, um, uh, but what drew me to the work was the, was the feeling that uh, you could make a difference in, in people's lives. And, and that continues to, uh, that continues to draw me to it. And that's why I'm drawn to study it, because I think that's what, what uh, drives a lot of folks to do this kind of work. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, as we continue our conversation, I'd like to draw everyone in if you have questions. So uh, I'll ask another question. And if anybody has any questions uh, uh, after Steve's response to this one, raise your hand and we'll kind of uh, uh, sort of weave in audience uh, to our conversation. But you, you used the phrase uh, when you were in law school, uh, you got hooked uh, on it. Uh, I know from talking to students behind your back that you have hooked <laughs> some of our students uh, uh, and uh, they are most grateful. Do you have any stories to, to share about students uh, from our law school whom you've worked with, uh, what they've done, uh, anything to share with uh, uh, faculty, with our guests, with our students uh, uh, about that experience? Wow. Um, I mean, there's nothing like seeing students who enter the clinic uh, with certainly a desire to work on behalf of refugees to provide them with a voice. Many of them have, and this is increasingly the, the case, a lot of experience in that area before they come to law school. I mean, uh, much, much more than I did which was zero actually before the lesson in terms of doing this kind of work, just some vague notion of wanting to help. But, but students are much more aware of things now certainly than I was. Um, but anyway, it's it's so heartening to see students um, uh, transform that interest into and, and utilize legal tools and legal skills in order to effectively represent them. Uh, in, in the many, many cases that uh, where we do this island for our clients. I mean, I would say um, in watching students interact with asylum seekers, you know, interviewing them, knowing that they're sitting across the table from someone who is traumatized, uh, has been traumatized, and communicating in that with them in a way that allows that person to describe what they have been through in their home country, which is very difficult. As anybody who's worked with trauma survivors knows, it's very difficult to build the kind of trust that's necessary to have them tell their story in a way that you can then convey it, or they, the student, can convey it to the judge in a compelling way that convinces the judge that they are entitled to asylum. And watching students over the course of the semester, or because we have the student director model here where students can take the clinic in their second year, watching them grow in that ability to um, create the trust with clients who come to us often not trusting any sort of authority figures, and it's certainly not lawyers, and seeing them go from that stage to being open about what's happened to them uh, in such a way that then they can um, uh, convincingly advocate for them, that is incredibly hard. Of course, when we get a grant of asylum, I mean, there's nothing like that. And, I, I, you know, uh, for some students, in the, I don't know if it's the highlight of their entire legal career, who knows what they're going to be doing, but there is nothing like that. Yeah. Okay. Yes, uh, Steve, congratulations. Uh, and you spoke a little bit about the comparative aspect of your book. I would like you to say a little more. You said in some countries, human rights and refugee rights are more tied to the constitution than in other countries. But you also said it takes activist lawyers or maybe human rights NGOs that mobilize activist lawyers in order to make the letters on the law come to life. And could you say a few comparative notes? You said in America, quite a number of activist lawyers but relatively weak um, incorporation of these rights in the US Constitution. You make some comparative notes. Where, where, where are these rights better protected? What is more important, the writing in the Constitution or the activism on the ground? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, this goes back to the ones spoke a little bit. Um, and uh, there's several factors based on these, these five countries that you, know, you can glean what, you know, what, what's the kind of environment where these units are um, most, can be most effectively utilized. I would say there are a few things just off the top of my head because you, you citing the U.S. example is, is, is right. I mean, in the U.S. we have 
uh, a, a, a very large cadre of lawyers who do this kind of work. And yet, the right, the constitutional rights are invoked very seldom. In fact, several of the lawyers I talked to said they don't want, they don't do that. And if they do it, they'll be laughed out of court. They focus on the statute, the, the Immigration Nationality Act, whether or not that's been violated, and something for the non lawyers are called the Administrative Procedure Act, which is is was the policy enacted according to administrative law? Was there enough time for people to comment on it and, and, and that sort of thing? Uh, but you don't argue the Constitution other than maybe due process rights. But anything more broadly than that, any kind of international human rights argument is probably counterproductive because the judge is going to think you must have a weak argument under domestic law mm -hmm. uh, if you're if you're drawing the Constitution or you know heaven forbid international human rights law. Um, in, in other countries, I think uh, certainly a progressive constitutional court helps because, first of all, it gives greater access um, to the court to, to hear questions, the constitutional questions. Um, so, Colombia has one, and South Africa has one. Mexico does not. But Mexico has had only one case thus far involving re uh, refugee rights. Um, and I'll talk about that in a second because it's it's relevant to your question as well. Um, South Africa has many and has issued some very progressive decisions. The problem in South Africa is they're not implemented because they have the Department of Home Affairs that out now refuses to implement the decisions. It is too bad. We're not doing it. Uh, sue us, right? So you file a contempt motion against the head of the agency, but you know that takes a long time. It's expensive, et cetera, et cetera. So. Um, the kind of court system, and then the kind of rights that, that you pursue. So I think the, the Mexico example is interesting to contrast with uh, Colombia. So Colombia has not had a lot of decisions either, but one of the one of the successful ones had to do with healthcare because they found that um, uh, the right to healthcare under the constitution, which is part of the Colombian constitution, applies to refugees and asylum seekers. But that's a right that applies to all citizens. And so um, uh, there, there's perhaps more sympathy for that. In Mexico, the case involved the deadline for filing an asylum application. So in the United States, as students know, you have one year to file an asylum application after you arrive in the US. That's a short amount of time, frankly. But in Mexico, it's 30 days, which is ridiculous. Uh, you have to get it together enough and maybe find a lawyer to help you put together an asylum claim in 30 days. I mean, I had no idea how we would function. Uh, so uh, they chat that was challenged as a, as a right as a violation of the right to asylum, and the uh, Mexican Supreme Court struck it down. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, upheld it. Said no, this, this is consistent with the right to asylum. Um, for reasoning, I won't go into now. But I think part of the reason for that was that was that's a right applicable only to asylum seekers. So it was you know, happened off by the court, as opposed to right to healthcare, right to education, things like that that apply across the board. And um, courts, as well as the general public, may be a little more amenable, amenable to it. So those those are those are some of the factors um, that that are at play. Thank you. Yeah, much. thank you all, and thank you for your all your help. Uh, it's in the background. Okay, I'll stand up, everyone, since you obviously walk up the stairs faster than I did. When I, <laughs> found out about the room. So I did rest for five minutes at each floor. And I kind of kept up. Um, so, Steve, I, I guess, depending on the cause and depending on who's in charge, cause lawyers lose a fair amount of the cases that they take on. And I, I know this is a dynamic that's not unfamiliar to you, but I wondered if the work you did interviewing lawyers around the world helped give you any new insights or takeaways on the value of doing the work, even in an environment where case by case, the successes aren't coming fast and furious and how that affects your view of how you counsel your students in this space and just, you know, how you how you factor that into the whole experience. Yeah, that's a great question. I, I, um, I would say that, I mean, the, the experience of interviewing these lawyers and hearing how they uh, navigate that, that space and, and deal with the disappointment that a lot of them feel was, uh, I feel like it was inspiring in some ways, like even with those many disappointments uh, and, and that feeling like they're just, they're just kind of trying to hold the wall, you know, as opposed to even advancing rights. 
but they they they, they still feel dedicated to that work. Uh, that made me, you know, that kind of inspires me to the kind of work we do in the clinic. And I hope that is conveyed <laughs> to the students. Uh, it certainly didn't make me more uh, disgruntled. I mean, I, I, I do, I, I do have some envy for the lawyers in other countries because they can utilize those human rights provisions. I think it makes for more creative lawyer, frankly, because you can. Uh, some of the lawyers in places like South Africa, maybe Colombia, talk about a human rights cocktail because they can they can borrow from various provisions in their advocacy: the right to dignity, the right to a fair hearing, um, due process, which we do have here in the United States. Um, but several rights that we do not have, and they can, in a sense, ask courts to pick and choose from those rights. And we here are much more limited. So that. That I suppose makes me a little bit more disappointed, but I think overall it's it's inspiring because it also makes me feel like we and the students are part of a, a global movement. You know, sometimes in the U.S., uh, not sometimes, a lot of times we get U.S. centric and Western centric uh, in our outlook on uh, a lot of things, certainly politics, uh, government, the law. We don't think about what operates in other countries. So. If I can bring that to bear in my teaching, so there's another there's another way to approach this. Maybe we should think about uh, using this approach. Maybe it's dangerous. Maybe we don't want to start making human rights arguments in our in our pleadings because we might get at that court and that will hurt our client. Right? Um, but I think maybe just just an awareness that there are other ways to look at these things helps helps the educational mission. Yeah. Thanks. Um. So. But perhaps somewhat similar to that, but more related to the development of individual lawyers. Um, I reflected on that on the comment about giving a voice to individuals, and certainly political voice is something that I think Steve noted was missing. But I think um, there's a challenge to a lot of lawyers to sort of move from the position of seeing ourselves specifically in cause lawyering and sort of rescuing people from their dire situation and acknowledging that individuals had a voice and we are simply a tool and amplifying it in a system, particularly with asylum that focuses on victimhood rather than survivorship. And just sort of curious on how you perhaps might do already incorporate that into teaching and how that might influence the way that we're training our upcoming lawyers to not see, you know, see ourselves in a privileged position and having these legal skills but also acknowledging that we are working in partnership with clients who deserve and should have had agency, um, even though their legal rights might not be recognized yeah. uh, in the system that we're fighting within together. Right. That's a great question, Sarah. I, and we struggle with that in clinic. And, 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 and I think we're transparent, at least with ourselves, uh, about that. Um, it comes up most prominently for me, I would say, and, and, and this goes to the, your, your issue about portraying them as victims. Right? And uh, so we hear their stories, and then of course we pick and choose what part of the story we're going to put in an asylum application, and we usually want to make it the most sympathetic right? and focus on the clients as victims, because we know that's going to release soon. That's going to give them the best chance at relief. And you know, a lot of these folks who get to the United States somehow are um, incredibly resourceful and strong and resilient. And it's a little weird to then cast them as total victims in front of the court. I mean, the way they, they just, just the, the, the journey that a lot of these folks make to get to the United States, you know, from Sub Saharan Africa, for example, to Brazil. Uh, and then, uh, you know, through um, northern South America and the danger of the journey um, through Central, I mean, to Central America, et cetera, not to mention what happened to Mexico and the difficulty crossing the border. I mean, uh, these are the people that, you know, you want in your society, right? So people who, who have some some uh, strength and resilience, and yet, of course, we're, we're turning them away. But, but, but anyway, you know, are we in the clinic and, and as advocates kind of focusing on the victimhood because that's what's going to that's what's going to get them uh protected in an individual case but that does that in some ways contribute to the narrative that these are just helpless individuals um and 
you know, what can we do about that? And you know, that's that's tricky because if I mean you in order to prevail in their individual case, you want to focus on the stuff that makes them uh, as sympathetic as possible. Um, but we struggle with that a lot. So uh, we've talked a lot about the people, the lawyers, uh, the work that they do. Uh, let's dive into the work of research uh, for, for a moment and uh, talk about contribution because you are contributing to many different <clears throat> bodies of inquiry, many different literatures. And one of the things when you read good research is it often seems easy. It seems that it all fits together really nicely. And that's a sure sign that there must have been difficulties and challenges all along the way. If there was a gap, that was a gap there for some reason in the uh, in, in the literature. And in particular, I want you to talk a little bit about the large quantitative studies that preceded yours that really defined the field where it was a lot of numbers, a lot of statistics, a lot of uh, uh, a lot of math. Um, and how, 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 how does your work sort of fit into that? And, and this goes along the theme of telling people stories uh, because the large quantitative research does a very, very good job at certain things, but it doesn't necessarily capture and tell the stories like you do. Yeah, yeah. Right, some of the, some of those articles with the math and the formula are really awesome because you see like these mathematical symbols. I have no idea what they what they are. I'm not reading this. Uh, so there's a lot of stuff out there, but um, yeah. So what what has dominated this field in terms of research over the years? And it's 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 a field about the effectiveness of human rights treaties generally, not not necessarily to uh, with respect to refugees, but but human rights treaties generally, and are they effective? Why do states sign them uh, or ratify them? And uh, so what the studies try to do, as Chris suggested, correlate factors like ratification of the treaty with human rights behavior of a particular state. And they torture their own citizens. Um, uh, you know, there, there are all sorts of indicia that have been developed to try and measure uh, how democratic a state is, for example, or how much do they respect human rights? But of course, these are statistical figures, and they're often contradictory. Um, there, and I go through some of those studies in the book uh, because some studies look at exactly the same question and come up with opposite conclusions because their methodological approach is different. And so then the question is which methodological approach is more valid? And that gets a bit frustrating and, and head spinning. But um, the other thing is they don't really look at what happens on the ground. It's it's these sort of statistical studies and correlations and trying to find statistically significant relationships between, let's say, ratification and human rights behavior. Now, one of the one of the most consistently found um, statistically significant variables, though, is constitutionalization. In other words, if, if a country has put a uh, human rights provision into its domestic constitution, there are statistical studies that show that. Um, it meets with some treaties, like the uh, uh, covenant on, on civil and political rights, that there is a statistically significant relationship that the country is more respective of, of civil and political rights. But I'm, I was always been interested, and I think this does go back to why I got interested in this in the first place, and what really happens on the ground. How do, how, do, how are lawyers using those, um, those provisions? That have been constitutionalized um, on behalf of their clients, in this case, refugees. And one of the reasons why this is such a, a relevant uh, area for study is that it's, it's, it's one of the most utilized areas of human rights law by lawyers, uh, by individual lawyers, because you can file cases in domestic courts in many, many countries of the world on behalf of refugees. It, it happens less so in other areas of human rights, or at least areas where people can get into court on behalf of individuals. So it's a really kind of a, a real bottom-up form of advocacy then then sort of top-down, which is what a lot of other human rights work is, a so bottom-up 
people bring claims, mostly, you know, many times represented by by lawyers. Um, but in the book, I try to get into and tell stories about the lawyers who are doing this work. It's not statistically significant, right? You're not going to show a correlation between, let's say, a constitution, whether a country has constitutional court and how well refugees are protected. That's trickier. There's too many factors to study, but it's 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 trying to get at some of the stories um, and and illuminate them in a real world fashion instead of just a statistical model. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a scene in the Aeneid where Aeneas he's been wandering around the known world for years, and his ship wrecks on the coast of Northern Africa. And he and his uh, faithful companion, wandering around, lost, they don't know where they are, they come to a temple. And at the temple, there's a large mural. And they look at the mural, and they realize that on the mural, there are the pictures and the images of their wanderings the images of the war that they uh, escaped. And they realize, and this brings Aeneas to tears, he says, perhaps our suffering has not been in vain. The people who are here already know of our stories and they're building their institutions in our name. And he looks to his uh, companion, Akatius, and he says, this is a reason for hope. And one of the things I see in Steve's book is a capturing of these stories. And as we close, Steve, did you have any story in particular or any, any uh, communication you have with lawyers uh, that, that gives you hope that, you know, that sort of captures a feeling that you'd like to share? Yeah. Well, first of all, I'm going to read the Aeneid. <laughs> it's now on the reading list. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, Boy, a particular story, and, um, and to end on a hopeful note, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's, that's, that's the first. That's, that, yeah, I'm trying to do that. I, I will say this: I, I, I would go to. I, I'll, I'll use the Colombian example. Um, part of it is because it's close, it's close to my heart because it involves local clinic. So, um, Colombia has has a, has a very small group of cause lawyers who are dedicated to representing refugees. Many of them are law clinics, including law students. It also has a, as I said earlier, progressive constitutional court willing to take on the government for some of its policies. So it's not as, as it is in some other countries, including Mexico, uh, uh, you know, uh, reluctant to disagree with, um, uh, with the executive branch. Um, and it also has, so we, and also there's the kind of the ease of access to the court where individuals can just petition uh, the constitutional court. I mean, there are clerks in the constitutional court who have got to call through all these petitions um, uh, to tell us the call to um, bring cases uh, before the court. And then what happens is that the constitutional court in some of those cases Besides, these folks who often have no lawyers need a lawyer to effectively bring this case. In other words, the case is important enough that it need these folks, the, uh, the litigants, that the applicants um, need uh, legal representation to, to effectively make their case. And they turn to the law clinics because there aren't kinds of NGOs we have in this country. And in this country, they go to the advocates for human rights and they'd say, you know, we need lawyers to represent these 10 folks, you know, these different cases because they raise really important issues. So they get a lot of folks in the law. <laughs> Talk about some envy here, you know, pedagogical envy. Uh, you know, you're getting a list from the constitutional court of the country saying, here's like 20 cases that we want to hear this term. Uh, which one, which ones would you like to represent? You know, we go to the students and say, okay, you know, it's like in the candy store, right? Uh, and you can pick which is the most sympathetic, who's the claimant in this case, what's going to have the most impact. Is there a risk of a bad decision? So maybe we avoid that one. 
some of them have the ability for some movement building. So it's not just the courtroom thing, but it's it's it, 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 it's the means for mobilization more broadly in society. I mean, we can talk about all those factors, and that's what they did. Um, so we're moving to Colombia next year. So that's hopeful, right? That's that's probably the most hopeful uh phenomenon that, that I saw. Now it's not to say that the Colombian lawyers are all you know doing cartwheels. Uh there's a lot of obstacles in Colombia. I mean, resources. Uh it's a very poor country. They've got a huge influx of Venezuelans now and, and uh not sure how to address that, etc. But some of the infrastructure for making some uh real impact. In, in a positive way, and using the constitution to do that is, is better than in Colombia, and I would say more so than any other countries that I look at. Well, I think we are at time right now, and I know that uh, those here want a chance to talk to you uh, individually. So uh, we have the reception uh, uh, here. Is it? Uh, uh, yes, yes uh, there's food right here. <laughs>